Good morning and welcome to this uh, policy dialogue uh, on the carbon border adjustment design, where we will explore the opportunities for international cooperation within uh, uh, CBAM. The event uh, of today is jointly organized by the EPC and the European Council on Foreign Relations, ECFR, with the support of Connecting Europe. Connecting Europe is a joint initiative by the EPC and the German foundation Stiftung Mercator. It aims to connect civil society organizations with the EU decision makers and to transnationalize debates on the EU, which is exactly what we will try to do uh, during today's debate on, uh, on CBAM. I will start with a short uh, overview of the program of today and some uh, housekeeping rules. So uh, I'm very happy to welcome our uh, three speakers today, Mr. Uh, Rafael Loos uh, from the ECFR, uh, MEP Mohamed Shahim, uh, who has been extensively working on the topic of CBAM and will continue uh, to do so in the future, and Ms. Emily Lidgate, Senior Lecturer at the University of Sussex, who is uh, an expert also in uh, the topic that we will be, we will be discussing uh, today. Uh, I will also uh, start with a short uh, presentation on the current status of discussions on, uh, on CBAM, just to set a little bit uh, the scene. In total, we have allocated uh, maximum seven minutes per, uh, per speaker to raise their main uh, remarks uh, that they would like. Uh, and after that, we will follow up with uh, a Q&A with you, with the public, uh, to be, for you to be able to, to ask your questions in about 20 minutes uh, to our speakers and to open the discussion on, uh, on CBAM, which will be uh, one that, uh, that might be one dominating uh, the, the climate agenda in, in the, common, the coming months. Um, as this has a uh, very important external and internal um, uh, yeah, importance for uh, the EU. For the Q&A, um, we would really like to make this uh, an interactive uh, matter. Um, I would like you to raise your hand if you would like to use your microphone, so you will have the ability to ask your question uh, in a spoken way, or to use the Q&A box. So I would also encourage you as much as possible, if you would like to use the Q&A box, to already do so during the interventions of the speakers. And then if you use the Q&A box, I will bring up your questions uh, during the Q&A. Again, otherwise you are very welcome to open your microphones. So I said, I will start with a short uh, stage uh, setting on the current status of discussions on, on CBAM. It's a file that can get uh, technical relatively quickly and I will try to do so in a, in a concise uh, but clear way. Uh, so CBAM was uh, a measure uh, announced to prevent carbon leakage, which is uh, the movement of uh, industry of production uh, uh, outside of a region where there is carbon pricing, exactly because of this carbon pricing. So it means that uh, industry moves its production um, because of the carbon price and not for other reasons, meaning that uh, carbon leakage leads to uh, less or no reduction in emissions. Um, or decreases the, the, the reduction in emissions due to an ETS uh, system. The measure of CBAM was therefore announced under the Green Deal to prevent this kind of carbon leakage, uh, and it should make production with lower emissions related to it more competitive inside and outside of the EU. It is still at this moment uh, unclear what the precise uh, CBAM measure will, uh, will look like. We are still waiting for the, uh, the presentation of the Commission of uh, the CBAM measures. Uh, we do have some indications, of course, because of the European Parliament's own initiative uh, report, where uh, uh, Mr. Mohamed Shahim uh, can, can uh, surely enlighten us about uh, uh, this process and uh, what it might mean for also the international aspects uh, today. Uh, some of those aspects are uh, on the design of CBAM, what it will look like, um, and the effects that it might have on uh, external countries uh, to the EU, so third countries. It is likely that importers will have to sur surrender certificates on the basis of embedded emissions in a product, the price of which will likely mirror uh, the price of the EU ETS. Uh, it is likely that this is what the overall system will, uh, will look like. There is a challenge of which uh, sectors might be covered by CBAM. So who has to uh, surrender those uh, certificates when importing to the EU? Uh, some of those sectors that could be covered are electricity, iron and steel, aluminium, cement, and fertilizers, or that could also go broader as was the case for the own initiative report of the European Parliament. Then other than the sectors being covered, uh, we can also uh, discuss which countries uh, should a priori be covered in relation to CBAM. Uh, a priori, all countries should be covered, but different countries could be granted exceptions. For example, least developed countries or uh, countries could be given exceptions 
if they implement certain uh, climate action, such as a linkage to the EU ETS. And then finally, there are uh, a couple of challenges also related to CBAM. First, in terms of the challenging costs to uh, assess the embedded emissions uh, and the scope uh, of uh, the emissions that are uh, priced in by a CBAM. For example, are we talking only about the scope of emissions of the production, or are we also talking about electricity-related indirect emissions or uh, the transport, for example, of those products? So how broad do we go uh, in terms of the scope of emissions? And uh, also, as demonstrated uh, in the own initiative report of the European Parliament, there will be a discussion about the free allowances and uh, the issue of potential double protection, also in light of WTO compliance of uh, a carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism. So those are the broad, or this sketches very broadly some of the challenges, uh, some of the opportunities uh, of CBAM, some of the different design possibilities. So the different sectoral coverage, different countries to be covered, uh, whether it mirrors the ETS or, um, or does something else, um, and then the challenges uh, and costs related uh, for, uh, for industry and for companies outside of the EU also. And so because of uh, all of these, uh, these aspects, uh, internal and external uh, to the EU, the CBAM uh, announcement has already elicited a number of, uh, of important international uh, reactions, which is the topic of, of today's uh, discussion. And we would like to, in this discussion, explore those international reactions a bit and uh, kind of draw some lessons ahead of the, the final commission proposal of uh, CBAM. I'll uh, briefly sketch a number of those reactions uh, internationally. Uh, one of the main reactions, of course, was that of the US where John Kerry, uh, the climate envoy of the US, has said to wait until COP26. But at the same time, the US has hinted at implementing its own carbon ad uh, adjustment mechanism. Um, and also the conclusions of the recent US-EU summit stated that the EU and US would closely coordinate to address the risk of carbon leakage. The recent G7 statement also recognized the importance of carbon pricing, so also in a multilateral, uh, multilateral uh, aspect the importance of carbon pricing and uh, related to CBAM um, have also been recognized. Then there are other partners uh, where there might be opportunities for uh, potential cooperation. The Green Alliance concluded with Japan on 27 May said that the partners envisage discussing carbon pricing as well as WTO compatible carbon border adjustment mechanisms. So directly hinting at discussion uh, between the EU and Japan about CBAM. Um, there is also the question of the EU and uh, ETS uh, linkage post-Brexit. Uh, post and all of these are opportunities for cooperation, but of course not all partners are necessarily happy, happy to see a uh, CBAM measure coming. China, for example, was reported to have reacted negatively during uh, a meeting with France uh, and, and German uh, or French and German heads of state. Uh, we can expect that uh, Russia might respond with uh, retaliatory measures uh, and might be less uh, happy about uh, a CBAM measure. And then there are countries that are strongly or maybe strongly affected uh, by CBAM, such as Turkey, but uh, CBAM might also strongly affect countries east of Europe, for example, Ukraine, which may be seeking a way around CBAM on the basis of its own uh, emissions trading system. So those are all um, uh, international reactions that we can uh, discuss or other international reactions, of course, as, uh, as relevant. So recapping, uh, whereas the EU sees uh, CBAM as an environmental measure, third countries at times uh, see it mainly as covert uh, protectionism uh, and have more uh, trouble accepting CBAM as an environmental measure. And it is exactly this tension uh, that we would, like, we would like to discuss in part uh, in this dialogue. Um, we will uh, um, uh, use this dialogue to uh, discuss how to increase uh, support on an international level and uh, finally also make a CBA measure, of course, more effective in light of the European Parliament's own initiative report and also the future uh, launch of the CBAM proposal. So with this, um, I will finish up and I will give the floor to Mr. Rafael Loss to uh, briefly introduce their findings on uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism and what it means for European member states and uh, externally for international partners. So Rafael, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thijs. Um, hello from Berlin. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for the introduction and for the collaboration. Um, yes, I, I prepared some slides that I will share with you. 
Wonderful. So earlier this year, we at ECFR tasked researchers in all 27 member states of the European Union to speak to national policymakers and climate experts on our behalf to uncover where national priorities and concerns lie with regard to Europe's green transformation. Among these challenges, these experts saw the for the implementation of the European Green Deal are mitigating socioeconomic consequences of the green transition, as you can see here, 19 of 27 member states expressed this as a concern, um, as well as the lack of uh, administrative capacity to make use of EU funds to green Europe's economies. Uh, and as risks of implementing the European Green Deal, they identified concerns about rising prices for energy and fuel, as well as carbon leakage, uh, as, as Thais described it, uh, the relocation of carbon intensive industries to third countries or the substitution of domestic products with more carbon intensive imports. Um, as Thais laid out, all these issues in one way or another concern the carbon border adjustment mechanism. CBAM is supposed to level the playing field for trade with partners with lower environmental standards and encourage them to adopt similar measures as the EU. It can therefore make an important contribution to fighting climate change globally while also ensuring uh, that European economies remain competitive. Yet it might also make certain products nominally more expensive for consumers. And it certainly requires an elaborate regulatory framework and robust administrative capacity at various levels of government to effectively calculate emissions along the entire value chain of certain products and enforce regulation. We also looked at the geopolitical context in which the European Green Deal will play out. Uh, the United States and China, for example, were seen by almost all member states as important for the EU's green agenda, be it as partners or as competitors. When we looked at Russia and Turkey, however, a different picture emerged. Here, member states that see either as important for the green transformation are regionally crusted to some extent. We also learned that concerns about carbon leakage are greater at the periphery of the EU, where supply chains are between EU and non-EU countries uh, are rather short and energy networks highly integrated, generally supporting the case for CBAM. This stands in contrast, however, with the image of some member states um, uh, uh, that they have of themselves and of the European Union as champions of free trade. Um, here we observed some concerns about CBAM um, that it might be interpreted by the EU's international trading partners as a protectionist measure. This could also undermine the EU's efforts to promote the rules-based international order. So if, for example, the WTO represents part of that order, uh, a CBAM that undermines WTO roles uh, would contradict other EU priorities. But even if CBAM is strictly WTO compliant, other countries might still threaten to or implement retaliatory measures if they consider it to be an overreach. Finally, we also looked at some public opinion polling data uh, through a poll we conducted in 12 EU member states. We asked which policy measures Europeans would support to address environmental issues. Uh, greater financial support for green public transportation systems came on the top which I think indicates a certain awareness uh, of the social justice dimension of the green transformation. In second place, and this is the red bar, um, though we see support for uh, tax on imports with a large carbon footprint. So essentially what, what CBAM is supposed to uh, uh, realize. To mitigate concerns about CBAM, I think, um, and the European Green Deal more broadly, both within the EU and among the EU's international partners, uh, the proposal should be couched in a coherent and proactive climate foreign policy. This is one of the conclusions of our recent study um, on, the, on the national politics of the European Green Deal. Uh, this requires, I think, great coordination between EU institutions and portfolios, but also among the different ministries within and between member states. We need to recognize, for example, that climate action will take place in, a, in an increasingly competitive environment. And if the ministries for environment, trade and foreign affairs don't talk to one another and to their counterparts at the EU level, um, a concerted European effort will flat fracture and fizzle. So in order to advance the green transformation um, of the European continent, you should pay particular attention to the dynamics in its eastern and southern neighborhoods. Turkey, the Western Balkans, Ukraine, Tunisia, some of these countries, uh, Thais already mentioned, um, and other countries uh, in our neighborhood are all important trading partners for the EU because of trade in goods or energy um, 
in addition to obviously the political and cultural uh, relationships that we have with those countries. Um, they will be affected by EU climate regulations. Uh, this presents an opportunity to green these relationships for mutual benefit, but also carrying some risk, of course, um, maybe more so than in our relations with uh, India, China, or Russia. We just have very different leverage uh, with respect to these neighboring countries than with some of the bigger powers. Um, accordingly, you, you should engage them early on to ensure that CBAM does not um, provoke uh, unwarranted resistance and anxieties. I think there is a there's a case to be made for a proactive climate foreign policy um, that is very strong and that certainly relates to CBAM as well for all the reasons that I and ties before me uh, outlined. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael, for your uh, for your introduction to this and, and raising those very important uh, points that I think um, are very important to reflect on, also from an institutional uh, perspective um, with CBAM coming up. With this, I, I would give the floor to, to Mr. Mohamed Shahim. Um, he um, uh, is uh, MEP, a member of the Committee uh, on Environment, Public Health and Food Safety at the European Parliament and has been working on this file and will be working on this file also in the future. So very happy to hear your, your comments to, to, these, uh, to these aspects. So thank you, Thais, and thank you, Rafael. I mean, I'm, I wasn't that, to be honest, I was quite, um, positive when I looked at uh, the presentation of Raphael. I think um, it was quite surprising for me that the second most supported measure is to at least uh, extern internalize the costs of CO2 of exports, of, of imports, I'm sorry. So I think people, and, and this is also, I think, a step towards, you know, consumption-based emissions. Yeah? So um, sometimes, uh, especially in the past, we had a lot of the base on uh, production-based emissions. So basically looking where products are produced and then looking at the CO2 content there and ignoring where the products end up. Uh, if we look at the CO2 footprint of Europe and if we include uh, the products produced for the EU, then our CO2 footprint is way bigger than uh, sometimes assumed only looking at European industry. So I think CBAM is one of the measures that could at least um, I mean, correct part of the uh, um, the miscalculations there, and I, I am very happy that people understand this because at the end of the day, it's all about whose interest are we looking at. I mean, it's not only about trade and economics; it's also about internalizing negative costs, natural co uh, uh, nature, biodiversity loss, um, climate, and CBAM is the first step to do a couple of things. And I don't want to talk about the mechanism because there are still a lot of complexities there. Let's be honest. It's not something that we will introduce easy and it's not something that will be easy to calculate exactly the difference, especially when countries will have their own emission trading system, how compatible are they, et cetera, et cetera. But it is one of the ways to, first of all, uh, uh, create a, a level playing field. Um, it's fairly simple. Produced products produced outside the EU don't are not part of the ETS system, and products produced in the EU, at least some of them are. So that's a way to 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 correct that. Second thing, it's one of the few mechanisms we have, one of the few policies we have, to say to producers outside the EU. So you either follow us and try to produce using the same standards that we want to see. Uh, lowest carbon uh, uh, footprint, uh, the best technology, and then you're welcome to sell your products in the EU. And if not, we will tax it. And it's up to them to show how good their technology is or how compatible it is uh, compared to the baseline or the base products or the, the benchmark maybe in the EU. The second point is, I mean, we need to be honest about, about uh, carbon leakage. Uh, ties. We really need to be honest because I don't want to tell my children when they uh, grow up that we have been telling a, a fairy tale for years. There's no scientific proof for carbon leakage. Why? Because, I mean, it's just one of the elements why companies uh, uh, decide to uh, uh, set their firm up in a country. It's not only tax or energy taxation, etc. I mean, there are many benefits we provide in the EU. Infrastructure, uh, connectivity, uh, human capital, uh, the, the, I mean, uh, democracy, 
uh, I mean, these are all very fundamental reasons why people set their company up in the in the EU. I mean, there's no proof of carbon leakage. There's no proof. It's a fairy tale. Every time I have debates in the parliament, I mean, people say, yeah, we have to be careful for carbon leakage. What carbon leakage? When was it? Give me an example. There's no proof in, this, in, in the literature. And, and, and we shouldn't say that, you know, at the one side, we want to introduce carbon, a CBAM, and at the other side, we want to keep the free, free allowances. I mean, we are at a crossroad. Eh? We either create policies that are fit for 55, and we will not, I mean, we, I'm not promising you a Pareto optimal uh, uh, tr uh, transition. I mean, there will be people that, uh, I mean, there will be people that win and there will be people that lose. And I prefer that the front runners in industry, the companies that are really performing well, CO2 wise, that we support them. And the companies that are lacking behind, yeah, there will be one day that we will, we will correct the benchmark. And that means that the free allowances will be corrected as well. And at some point, if we introduce uh, uh, CBAM, and as I said in the parliament, in a gradual way, you know, we don't have to be very strict in the beginning, but there will be a point that we have to increase the CBAM measures, maybe increase the number of sectors or in increase the price. And then at the same time, decrease the free allowances in that sector. These are communicating vows, as we say. So, um, and I know that, you know, talking about the climate law, talking about ambition is really easy. Eh? I mean, you can promise everything what you want to your children, to your parents, to your, to your, to your partner. Uh, you can promise the world. But that someday you have to make sure that the implementation is in line with your promise. And that's exactly what we will do, do on the 14th of July. And people are getting a bit stressed and a bit nervous with the effects or with the policies that the commission will come with. But you cannot... As they say, as the Brits say, you cannot eat your cake and have it too, or that's the other way around. I once Googled it and I think both are okay. So you cannot have that. You cannot stay your ambitious, but then when the measures are on the table, start hesitating. You know, oh no, wait a minute, but that's important for my member state, that part of industry. Oh, but oh, wait a minute, uh, we still have this old sector that doesn't want to transform. I mean, in the EU, at the European level, in the parliament, I'm always saying, you know, we want to have the CBAM. We want to decrease free allowances, but we also want to support industry to become less CO2 intense. So at the end of the day, both CBAM and even the emission trading system, in theory, are temporary measures. At some point, we don't want to have CO2 or we only want to have uh, like that part of the CO2 emissions that are um, almost unemitted, uh, 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 you know how I said, that we cannot mitigate. And then we will see how to incorporate that in our economy. But these are temporary measures. They will not be that strict as some people uh, think uh, uh, they will be. The commission, I mean, we've seen the leaks. It will be introduced uh, 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 slowly to some sectors that are quite well manageable. And it's up to the importers or the producers to buy the certificates. I think, I think it's an important measure to start with. And I think it has to mirror ETS because else we don't have this, uh, this, this um, a level playing field. And for me, it's very important that this is not, and it's all about the intention. Eh? The intention is that we want to decrease our carbon footprint in the EU, con consuming wise. It's not a way to punish China or uh, uh, um, you know, lower middle income countries. That's not the idea at all. It's also not an idea to envision very high revenues that we can use to finance our next generation EU. It doesn't make sense uh, if, if we want to decrease CO2 emissions, then, I mean, this is a temporary fund. And I don't think the WTO will accept it that we start talking about uh, very big possibilities of the high revenues that we can have with the SEBA. So for me, it's just about, okay, we have a target for 2030, we have a target for 2050. We have to do many things at the same time make our industry more sustainable, which means that probably less emissions are needed, which means that the free allowances also doesn't, don't make sense. But while we are doing that in the EU, we have to make sure that other countries outside the EU join us in our effort, join us to also become state of the art when it comes to producing steel, producing fertilizers, producing whatever, especially for the European market. But if we are lucky, they could also, I mean, join us and 
make their whole way of producing a, a, a cleaner. I mean, at the end of the day, even if we become climate neutral, if the rest of the world doesn't join, then uh, I mean, the efforts will be uh, um, uh, useless because we will not meet the Paris Agreement. And uh, concerning the US, it's, I mean, we are we're quite lucky now that there's a new administration. I think John Terry wants to wait until the COP26 to see whether they can have something in the spirit of the Paris Agreement, you know, something very major where the national determined contributions are so high that everything is fixed to meet the Paris Agreement. But part of that will be CBAM. And if they join, if the US and the EU join to create a mechanism that's in line where we at least avoid the trade war between each other, then I think it's natural that other countries will join as well. Because at the end of the day, we would prefer to have an emission trading system worldwide with a CO2 price that's set worldwide, because that's the only way to accelerate the green transition. And I think we should, we should really do our best to, to get there. Um, and one last point, because uh, I know that you know, these trade agreements are quite complex. Uh, we've had many trade, bilateral trade agreements with either countries or with regions. For me, it's very important that when we set the C-bomb, that the C-bomb will be incorporated in these trade agreements. Because if we don't do that, then who will be affected? Only the least developed countries or low and middle income countries. And I don't think it should be a mechanism to, to attack countries where they have many other issues that should get priority and we should help them make their industry more sustainable. Uh, so at the end of the day, if that's the, if that's the effect of the CBAM, then I will object. And we also in, in, introduced this into the, into the, uh, into the in, initiative report of the parliament. It should be placed broader also with countries where we have trade agreements with China, with the US, with South America, with all the countries where we have an intense relation, uh, trade relation to, and especially the countries surrounding the EU, because I do believe that sometimes we look at China when it comes to steel, but the biggest steel importer for the EU is Turkey. So sometimes our economic uh, uh, relations are way closer. You've mentioned the Ukraine. Uh, I think North Africa is quite important when it comes, when it comes to electricity uh, production, especially in the upcoming years. At the end of the day, the sea bomb has to be there. It has to be fair. It has to be effective because with a, um, with a marginal CBAM where actually, and, and keeping the system of free allowances, I don't believe will be an effective tool. I think for now, this is it. And if, we, if there are any questions later on, then of course, I can try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Pishaim, for, for this intervention. And I think uh, we will indeed come back to, to a number of those issues in the, in the Q&A. Um, but without further ado, I would now uh, like to give the, the floor to uh, Ms. Emily Lidgate, a senior lecturer at the University of Sussex. And I would ask you the question then, in terms of uh, CBAM and international relations, referring to the statement of MP Shahim, can we have our cake and eat it? Or uh, is that not the case? Yes, as the, as the representative bread, I suppose it is incumbent upon me to address uh, cakeism. Uh, so, um, and, and by the way, thank you for inviting me to this uh, Brussels-based conversation, even virtually, uh, despite all the um, many new border barriers we have to overcome, I'm very happy to, to be here. Um, so, um, I thought, you know, I mean, I guess the short answer to your question is no. I mean, that's the that's the obvious answer to to cakeism, but um, but to sort of address that in a, in a, in a slightly more uh, detailed way, um, I thought it might be interesting at this stage in the discussion to bring in the Commission's uh, current thinking, um, as represented by the by the sort of the leaked draft proposal, which many of us have seen, um, which offers a relatively uh, concrete, uh, no pun intended, focus um, for thinking through the international cooperation dimensions of this. Um, and um, one way of thinking about this is, does this leak proposal make international climate cooperation more likely or does it undermine it? Um, how might the EU's approach to CBAM facilitate international cooperation? Um, but I should I should first start by saying that I really don't envy the Commission right now. I mean, we've we've learned from Raphael about some of the array of, of 
pretty complex internal pressures from member states and from EU industry. At the same time, you know, we're, there's all kinds of external pressures from trade partners and in the upcoming uh, COP and, and, and the Paris Agreement negotiations. Um, so what, what really struck me about this sort of leaked draft proposal is the extent to which the Commission seems to be catering for the sort of the internal audience, the internal concerns, um, really to some extent at the expense of the internal ones, the external ones. I mean, I have no reason to doubt that there's some strategy here, you know, perhaps to clarify the art of the possible before the, the proposal is published um, in a couple of weeks. Um, and of course, the Parliament's position on some of these issues is 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 different, um, and I'll I'll return to that. Um, but be be all that as it may, I'd like to say something about why the 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 Commission's position, as currently drafted, in my view, actually um, undermines to some extent international climate cooperation. And and this speaks to I think a, a broader tension about carbon border adjustment, which is is the EU going to be an outlier or is it going to be a front runner? Um, and obviously the, the latter is, is, is where we want to be, to be aiming with this. So um, the first reason I think this is, this is a tricky proposal is that it sets out a very steep and treacherous path to joining a climate club. Um, well, what do I mean by that? Well, one route to international cooperation on carbon border adjustment is of course the idea that uh, countries with these ambitious climate targets band together against the rest of the world and impose import duties on them. Countries in the club do not leave the carbon border adjustment on um, each other. And the idea is if enough countries do this, this increases the incentives for others to join the club and then eventually phases out or limits the need to have carbon border adjustment. And we get to that elusive goal of the strong um, international uh, carbon price. So um, in, in the leak proposal, there's the only way to join this EU club automatically. In other words, to avoid all CBAM charges is to have a linked ETS scheme or be part of the ETS. So this is a really short list. So we have the EEA in Switzerland. They have formally the same carbon pricing as the EU. So if we take the case of the UK, for example, you know, it has an FTA with the EU that commits both to carbon pricing of equivalent effectiveness with some pretty strict enforcement mechanisms behind that, but that isn't sufficient. Um, the EU has said that individual, uh, you know, producers can be um, absolved of this if they already pay domestically, but they have to go through a pretty difficult administrative sort of bureaucratic pathway. Um, and the proposal also raises this idea of sectoral agreements, which, which I'll return to in a moment. But in some there's, you know, at, at a minimum, you know, a huge new administrative export burden on climate allies from this proposal. Um, and the second reason is the decision not to acknowledge developing countries explicitly in the in 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 the legislative framework and not to dedicate CBAM revenues uh, to climate finance for developing countries. Um, which, you know, uh, we, we already heard some reflection about that. So this proposal is, is basically built on the presumption that all um, exporters should pay the same as EU producers. It doesn't integrate common but differentiated responsibility, which, you know, if it's unamended is clearly going to raise issues at the COP. So obviously this is really tricky to decide how to integrate common but differentiated responsibility. Even if we limit this just to the category of least developed countries, there's an idea, you know, that they, that they won't be affected because they don't really export the goods covered by the agreement. Um, but actually, um, according to IEP analysis, for example, Mozambique seems likely to be impacted more strongly than China for aluminum, Cameroon more strongly than India, and, and Zimbabwe at least as strongly as the, as the so-called basic countries on iron and steel. And then there's the issue of intermediate. So, um, you know, bauxite, for example, it's an important export market for, for a few LDCs. Um, and, the, and they will be affected by, the, by this additional charge. So in sum, if we look at the sort of the net zero club of potential carbon border adjusters, and I'm thinking primarily about the UK and Canada, also to some extent the US, you know, they're, they're not happy. Um, if we look at developing countries, both the big, the big guys, you know, Brazil, India, China, and the LDCs, they're, they're, not, they're not happy. And I think these issues are important because CBAM is, I think, a high-risk proposal. And, and the risk is that the thing implodes in the sense that 
It impedes progress in climate talks. It creates an obstacle in, in the EU working together with, with sort of developed country climate allies. So, um, you know, so that I guess leads to the question of, of, of how, how could we, you know, improve this? Um, and, um, you know, with respect to climate clubs, I, I acknowledge it's always going to be really tricky cooperating with other countries on regulatory issues. I mean, we're very keenly aware of this in, in, in the UK EU relationship. Carbon pricing is, is a regulatory issue. So particularly if these countries are used to being in charge, you know, like the US and the EU, it's, it's tricky to come up with, with, a, with an approach to coordinating. Um, but I think that requiring uh, trade partners to conform with specific EU regulatory requirements in order to be exempted from CBAM charges um, is possibly a self-defeating approach with respect to increasing global climate cooperation. So nothing in the sort of the draft proposal um, precludes a more expansive approach to sort of designating countries as being exempted on the basis of having say equivalent ambition. Um, sectoral agreements are really uh, interesting, I think, potential way forward um, to, to, to work together on absolving other countries of these charges. Um, with respect to developing countries, again, I acknowledge this is really tricky, you know, clearly, though, I think channeling some revenues to climate finance for developing countries, or, or at least sort of capacity building to help them uh, adapt to this regulation um, is, is, is a more politic way of, of using revenue. Um, there's also an interesting conversation to be had about sort of exempting some countries like LDCs. I mean, this has the potential to sort of backfire and turn them into emissions uh, havens. But if you if you think carbon leakage is a myth anyways, then, then that won't be a problem. Um, and I guess that's an interesting uh, element of this as well. So, um, you know, and of course the parliament's uh, own initiative report does sort of give special consideration to least developed countries. So ultimately, I think with respect to this issue of international cooperation, you know, we, we just have to ask what is the objective function of, of CBAM? Um, and, and the parliament phrases this, you know, explicitly as pushing EU partners to raise their climate ambitions. So that means that if we're thinking about how to design this thing, we have to think about policy design pathways that will make it more likely to achieve this outcome. That isn't to say they will eliminate uh, resistance, but they make it more likely to to bring others along. Um, in other words, being a front rather that a front rather front runner rather than an outlier. Um, and actually, I think this is this 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 is very exciting because this is an area. You know, speaking as a sort of international trade uh, <laughs> policy nerd, um, for some really interesting sort of policy and in, in, uh, innovation and, and and new forms of of international trade cooperation. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for those very interesting um, reflections. Just a reminder to our public also, I see that we already have uh, quite a number of questions coming in, uh, but uh, just a reminder that you can use either the Q&A box or raise your hand after which I will, uh, I will give you the, the floor um, and our events team uh, will kindly uh, um, yeah, give you the possibility to open your microphone. Um, I would, to kick off though the discussion, despite the questions coming in, uh, I would like to make use of my, my position as moderator to ask one broader uh, opening question. Uh, so apologies for that. But um, I think uh, both uh, Emily and Raphael and, uh, and Vishayim have referred to uh, this possibility of, of CBAM to kind of fall apart under international, uh, international pressure. Um, and so the question that I had was whether, because, you know, if we want to then uh, protect this uh, CBAM measure, however it will look, uh, we will need to be on one line and, and form one front, obviously. I think that was, that was raised also in, in all of your uh, discussions. So my question would be um, whether the EU is sufficiently on the same line uh, institutionally, that includes member states, but also the European Parliament, uh, to effectively implement uh, a CBAM me mechanism in the international context. So I don't know if uh, any of you had the reaction. Uh, maybe Mr. Shahim, I see you. Uh... I'm trying to unmute. You, you can say you can call me Mohammed, by the way. I, it sounds a bit silly that you go by. Uh, you, 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 say, you say Emily and Ma, Raphael and I'm Mr. Shane. Just call me Mohammed. I have no issues with that. I'm from the Netherlands. We have a we have a quite horizontal society. 
Uh, so, uh, but anyways, I, I mean, I, l l l let's let's I mean, let's slow down a bit. You know, if I look at the proposal of the commission, I I read it, but I actually don't like to read leaks because you can get surprised uh, in the final version. But if I look at the implementation, and if, I, if I think if, I think it will be introduced, it will be like a a light C band on specific sectors or specific products. Then we will have time and the EU to look at, you know, the required diplomatic effort that it's needing to reach the affected countries and other countries. I think we also have in that in that phase where we are introducing it in a, in a light way, we have to think about, you know, how to reuse parts of the revenues, the current revenues, but at, at that time with the current revenues, but also the future ones to use for this International Climate Fund. Just remember, uh, we've, we've promised more than 100 billion a year for climate uh, finance. I think there's zero euro in it up to now. I mean, there are just promises. So we have to think about that as well. And I think CBAM can be an element there. And, and in this, you know, in this diplomacy, in these negotiations with climate partners, with uh, low middle income, non-EU countries, we have to see what is needed to make it a success. It's not that, you know, we have one, it's not like a zero sum game. We introduce it and then you, let's wait how the outcome will be. We will, ha we will have time to adjust. How many years did, did it take to introduce ETS and to have it working as it is now? I mean, in the beginning, there were a lot of issues, problems. It wasn't working. There were a lot of uh, things to correct. So I think if we introduce it slowly for some sectors uh, and we and use the time to talk to other countries, to, to, to uh, also just negotiate with other sectors and then introduce it in a light way, I think uh, we can make it more successful uh, uh, at the end. Uh, so, I mean, and I think that is the approach of the, of the parliament, but also I think that's the intention of the European Commission, if I look at the, at, at the league. Uh, and then we can address all the issues that Emily has uh, has uh, has uh, 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 has 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 mentioned. I, I think it's very important to, again, this is one of the few instruments we have to put pressure on other countries to, to join our effort. And of course, I mean, it shouldn't affect Zimbabwe harder than it affects India or China. I mean, that that doesn't make any sense. So we have to look at those uh, at, at those things. And I was one of the people in the parliament that said we. I think we have to exempt. Uh, some of the uh, least developed countries, uh, because I don't think it should be a, 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 an instrument only to punish them. I don't believe that that the creation of carbon havens will 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 become true. I mean, we have tax havens. It will be. I mean, it would surprise me that. Uh, I mean, but but then my talks about carbon leakage doesn't exist will then be crushed. But I don't believe that that will that will happen. I really believe that there's a there's a very openness also from those countries to improve and make their industry more sustainable. And there are also opportunities like hydrogen, you know, I think Africa can play a big role in the production of sustainable fuel, sustainable energy. And I think there are there are also ways to see whether we can help them set up these type of industries that we also need in the EU, but also needed in, the, in, in other parts of the world. So that's my first reaction on your question. Thank you very much. Um, maybe Rafa, would you like to uh, respond to this and give some reflections? Yeah, sure. Um, two points. Um, uh, the first one relates to something that um, both Emily and, and Mohamed uh, uh, mentioned regarding the uh, revenues that CBAM is likely or unlikely to raise. Um, the, the European Union, the European University Institute and, and, and Florence um, did some, some uh, calculations on this and, and even in the highest range the revenues only reached sort of a few hundred million euros annually. Um, this is considering the sectors that were covered in the, in the league uh, proposal. But so this relating relating this to the uh, to the promise that the developed countries at the G7 meeting um, a few weeks ago reiterated that they want to provide a hundred billion euro dollars euros annually for developing countries in order to improve their climate efficiency and reduce emissions. There, this is really just you know, marginal. If we talk about a few hundred million euros from CBAM compared to 100 billion annually um, that should go to those countries, uh, we need to think of, of different um, paths to make this possible. CBAM will not make a, make a major contribution to this. 
Um, and then secondly, I think uh, if we if we couch the CBAM proposal on the European Green Deal more broadly, as I mentioned, into a broader sort of more proactive and coherent foreign policy that needs to be also supported by the member states and essentially every meeting that they take over the next two or three years or so with partners uh, all around the world that CBAM is not a protective measure, it is support, support, supposed to, to reduce European carbon emissions. Um, and we want to create this in a way that, that, you, that is participatory and inclusive, and it helps you reduce your emissions as well, um, while, while maintaining competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis Europe and, and other countries around the world. And even if we, uh, or additionally, if we, if we make funding available to, to improve um, um, uh, carbon efficiency, then, then that I think would be a very welcome approach um, uh, around the world. But yeah, we need to, at, at COP26 and in the next couple of years, we need to be open to, to sort of alternative approaches as well. This CBAM should really be a proposal and that's something that we present to the world as a fact um, that is unmovable and that the European Union sticks to now for the foreseeable future and um, without valuing the input that, that partners in the East and the Southern neighborhoods in particularly have that the US might have, uh, that development countries might have. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe Emily, if you would like to come in. Um, well, I think an interesting way of, of approaching this question is, is to ask why, why CBAM? Why not just use performance standards, right? If we, if we could apply all of the EU performance standards to everything coming in, achieve more or less the same uh, result, which some of us uh, think is a better idea. But, um, no, but, um, but I think the presumption there is that, you know, somehow carbon uh, taxing is it's less in, in, intrusive, it's relatively simpler, and it provides a sort of literally common currency for understanding how we're approaching, um, how we're mitigating uh, carbon or, or CO2 emissions. Um, so accompanying that with an extremely intensive uh, verification and compliance procedures to me seems almost to threaten being the worst of both worlds. So, um, so that, that's why um, you know I think that um, a, a key to getting acro this across the line um, is going to be some flexibility with that with that parameter. So I mean, at the most extreme, we could say you know. Uh, and, and by that I mean in terms of who who has to pay this thing, you know, and how how do we assess their 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 equivalence of how much they're paying domestically? Because, you know, it, it, in the most extreme, we could just say, hey, you know what? Anyone who has a net zero by 2050 emissions target is exempted from this because we're just going to presume, however you do it, you know, you're 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 imposing equivalent kinds of penalties on your industries. Obviously, that's that's a, a huge relinquishing of control. But maybe there's a middle path where we could just you know, and, and I think the UK EU FTA is a great example of this. It's it's not requiring the the UK to link with the ETS, though we all you know hope they do. Um, but um, but it's just saying, look, we have equivalent, you know, we have equivalent ambitions, and and that's in and we're going to codify what those are, and that's enough. I want to. I, 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 I. I'm I'm a big fan of uh, of uh, performance standards and product requirements. To be honest, I had this. I was debating this with 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 the shadows. I mean, that's the most simple way to to cut off CO2 stand uh, CO2 emissions. Just to say, we don't want a type of steel that's not produced uh, with the mac with with this maximum CO2 content. You know, I mean, that's that's uh, yeah. If the goal is to decrease CO2, I think product standards and performance standards. Why not? They should stay on the table. So Emily, I you know you saw how I, what I did when we said it. I was became I, I was quite happy. So I'm I'm a big fan of these uh, type of instruments. Thank you very much for your reactions. Uh, we'll we'll transfer now to to the other questions of the public. I would like to give the floor to Matthias Schiffers who had a question. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep, I've got two questions. One is, um, well, it's it's the, the CBAM is a way of protecting firms, of course, um, uh, against um, uh, companies that work from outside of the European Union. Um, but now some some sectors like steel have high, have lobbied for uh, for this uh, instrument a lot, but now they are not very happy with the way it turns out to be because they have to uh, surrender their free allowances. Um, Business Europe, the, the, the lobby group, has said actually leave it to the companies whether they want to be uh, covered by CBAM. Um, would that be a good solution? Um, or what would you have against it? Um, and another question is uh, the companies say, well, if we do it like this, 
we cannot compete on the global stage anymore because we have um, when we export our products outside of the Europe. We, we are at disadvantage because we pay for a CO2 price and they don't pay for uh, other companies don't pay for it because they are uh, only paying for it as soon as they uh, export something to the European Union. Do they do companies have a, a, um, a point with that argument? Thanks. So Thais, do you want to sign yeah. this or do you want the policy? This is a answer. Uh, Mohammed, I'm sorry. <laughs> the floor is yours. Oh, maybe a scientist will want to answer. I mean, I'm a politician. I'm also uh, from a specific party. So, Matthijs, thanks for your question. <laughs> there are two questions. First of all, I don't think we should let the sectors themselves decide what type of policies they should should be applied on them or not. I mean, this would be very silly if we would. I mean, what kind of president would this be? Uh, I don't think it would be fair. I mean. What do you think the outcome will be? I don't think that any sector would want to have it. I, in, in the beginning, when I started to, to talk about CBAM, I had talks with many sectors, many. And I, all of them were like, most of them were like so happy with CBAM. So happy. Yes, we want to have it. But they assumed that the free allowances would stay on the table, that it would be like a mechanism on top just to protect them. And that they could get also export rebates to export to correct the, the, the mechanism when they're exporting. It's, it's very funny, yeah? they, they want to have only the good things and there's nothing changing for them now. So as I said, they want to have, they are the part of the Pareto Optimal where for the others it becomes worse and for them it's, it only improves. That's not how wo the world works, to be honest. So if we introduce it, we have to address the free allowances. That's, I mean, let's, let's stop cakeism as, as, as Emily said. Second point is we had many debates internally about are we allowing export rebates? And we don't want to have like uh, 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 the export rebates to be like, um, like a, a compensation, for, like a, a negative CBAM. So when, uh, when there's the CBAM, you have to pay. And if you're exporting, we'll give you money to correct for CBAM or something because of the ETS uh, allowances that you pay and uh, companies outside Europe don't have to do that. We didn't want to have that. We said, Listen, within the ETS, we identify the 10% best performing uh, companies within or uh, best performing benchmark. And this is already part of the ETS. Why not incentivize EU companies to improve their CO2 footprint by saying, if you belong to the 10% best performing uh, state of the art companies uh, when it comes to CO2 standards, those companies should. Uh, uh, be given an export rebate because at the end of the day, that's also good for the rest of the world. So let's say you have a company that produces a product in the most sustainable way. If you, if you allow them to export those products and you help them export those products, then of course, when those products are being bought uh, 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 or, or being used as a substitute for other more polluting products, that decreases the CO2 print of the world as well. So for us, if, at least for me, and I'm not the only one in Parliament who has uh, who has, uh, 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 has has stated this, we want to use export rebates as an incentive for EU companies to actually improve and become more ambitious ambitious about uh, on the way they produce their products. That's for me the only way I think we should use export rebates. Uh, and, and of course, I hope I answered the question of Matthijs. Eh? Uh, I, I think otherwise, uh, maybe Rafael or, or Emily, you can you can complement and uh, and answer to to those questions. I mean, just a just a really quick addition. I think um, you know, considering the the uh, ETS free allowances, if we if we, I think what will be possible is to keep those and CBAM just for WTO compliance reasons as well. If we would open ourselves up to to. Um, to retaliation, I think, left and right, uh, if we kept both, um, specifically for the reasons that, that Mohamed just um, uh, outlined. Um, but in a sort of transition phase, I think what might be a good idea is, is using the free allowances to specifically um, uh, uh, push breakthrough technologies and innovation in, in Europe, similar to um, what, what Mohamed just mentioned with respect to um, the top 10 performing countries. You could also do this with within the, within the free allowances framework and, and really uh, push innovation within Europe through that system. I would just 
very, very briefly say that, yes, I think having um, industries opt in or opt out would undermine the um, environmental purpose. Um, if given the choice between free allowances and, and CBAM, I imagine they would, uh, <laughs> they would decide to stick with their, with their free allowances, which they never appreciated quite enough. Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, this is a great example of the external imperatives versus the internal imperatives clash. If, if there, there are many potential WTO perils with this, but I think as, as Raphael said, if once you start giving your domestic producers free allowances and charging importers, then that's immediately going to be a, a, a big problem for, for the WTO. Um, unless there's any urgent reactions, I will continue with another question as we're uh, slowly running out of time. Um, so uh, Delphine Gallon uh, from the ESC asks, where do speakers stand on the question of including transport related impacts on climate in CBAM calculations? And how that, could that issue play into the context of WTO, WTO compatibility and maybe also more extensively uh, in terms of international reactions? Um, I don't know if uh, anyone wants to pick up this question first. If there are no other volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the EU has framed this in a, in a per, very particular way in terms of the, the using the echoing the language with adjustment, what your border adjustment, what is this? So this comes from the idea of tax adjustment, um, which is basically this the destination principle of taxation, which is, you know, our, you should pay the tax where something is consumed, not where it's produced. So um, so it's extending this concept to um, carbon uh, emissions tax, which is a complicated application of this concept. Um, but nonetheless, it's a very established concept in, 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 in WTO law. There's papers going back to the 1970s from the GATT about this. So, so in that sense, it's a well-trodden path. Once you start taxing transport, however, that's not, um, that's not, that's a different category of, um, it's no longer a carbon border adjustment tax. It's a tax that specifically applies to the act of trading the product. So um, to me, this would be um, more difficult to justify um, because you couldn't use the logic of border, of border tax adjustment um, and it would become a tax on, on trade. So I think um, it's, 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 a bit of, it's a bit of a gray area, I would say. Uh, or Mohammed, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I agree with Emily. I mean, it's quite complex, but I do see that within the parliament there are debates, for example, take biomass or the renewable energy directive where the origin of the products are taken into consideration. So for example, if we look at the biomass definition, then the, basically if, uh, if there's a production uh, forest, uh, it doesn't matter where it's in, whether it's in Finland or in Canada, um, uh, although the transport from, I mean, the origin does play a role um, in, in the CO2 content, but I think there will be other instruments in line where we will look at the transport part of our, basically our ecosystem. So with that, we will have, of course, the extension of ETS to maritime, the extension of ETS to, to aviation, also from outside the EU, there will be, I mean, there are other policies where we can tackle that part of the, the, the problem. It doesn't have to be, uh, everything has to be fit in CBAM. That's why we have 12 legislations coming up under the Fit for Climate or Fit for 55 package. And, it, and it's not one package. So the combination of all these legislations will help us decrease our CO2 footprint. And then uh, I think the transport part will be addressed in another uh, legislation. I don't think we can mix that into the CBAM. It's already very complex to calculate the carbon content of final products. Yeah? Because products go, uh, you know, parts are imported, then exported, then come back again. Then, I mean, it's a very complex logistic uh, um, logistic uh, chain uh, and already calculating that from a consumption based uh, point of view what then the final uh, carbon content is and, and you should not double count things that's already quite complex one if we add on that the different uh, uh, different transport options 
uh, that 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 will make it over. I, I think it will it will uh, it will blow up in complexity, and I think we have to address that in other uh, in other policy in other policies and regulations or directives. Sorry. Yeah, Sirkin, I don't know, Rafael, if, if you still want to come in or. We can cut it off there uh, because I see that it's uh, unfortunately already 11 o'clock. There are still some question re questions remaining, so apologies for not being able to treat those um, to treat those today. Uh, hopefully, we can do so in a in a future uh, edition uh, where we can follow up on the actual proposal of uh, of the commission. Um, so thank you very much uh, to our speakers, Mr. Rafael Loss, Ms. Emily Lidgate, and Ms. Mohamed Shaim for joining us uh, here today. Thank you to our attendees um, who, um, yeah, uh, who kindly asked all their questions. Um, and we look forward to seeing us for you for one of our future uh, events, hopefully also on this same topic. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. And thank you for the, for the Emily and Rafael for the, uh, I've learned a lot today. So, and thanks for inviting me guys. So hopefully in the future, we can have more of these type of, uh, uh, of, of talks. Yes. Thanks. Much pleasure. Bye. Bye.